category of who can participate or be a, a member of this kind of group, but it is a sort of aegis under which we can operate to uh, to try and generate exactly the kind of cross-party, sort of unilateral, perhaps more experimental discussion, in a sense. Uh, within. I, I think we're sympathetic to your overall... You know, the, the, um, the, uh, but I'd rather widen it a bit to edu un particular university education generally. I mean, architecture is only a specific case. All of the things that you describe about uh, universities becoming more and more a kind of service industry to a capitalist economy, uh, architecture is only a part of that. Oh, it's gone. Architectural education is a specific example of a, of a broader issue about university education. And so I suppose to, you have to experiment with one department, but do you find you have any sympathetic colleagues in, the, in your university at, at large in other disciplines, in physics or biology or history or... Well, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I mean, I would agree with you that, that what... Uh, most architecture schools that, that happen to be embedded within larger university structures are, are, are finding is that they are being forced into kind of parallel uh, assessment structures. So uh, certainly in, in the States, um, there, is a, there is a kind of one-size-fits-all uh, model of assessing both schools and faculty, and increasingly there's a sort of flattening of... Uh, let's say, you know, testing, uh, training, um, the tenure track process, there's a streamlining of, of education because education ultimately, again, at least in North America, uh, is a business. And so it's not surprising that, you know, for instance, at the university I'm teaching uh, in currently, the University of Southern California, uh, my understanding is that like a full 60% goes straight to the university for administration, which means the school is left with 40% of its income to teach uh, and, and for resources. So the enormous burden on schools within universities uh, to perform economically, and, and this is mostly because universities are increasingly corporatized and are structured at for profit institutions. And I, I think the minute that the profit enters the subject of education and the minute that, that uh, students become consumers and education is commoditized, there's a tendency to try to make uh, education generic and palatable and, and, and easy to deliver. I think we're seeing this especially with online training as well. So certainly architecture is kind of part of this trend. But uh, in terms of any any sort of uh, uh, feedback that I've received from colleagues, I, not surprisingly, the support that I've, I've received within the academic community has been from most of my friends in local art schools. Um, and uh, I've had a lot of uh, great discussions with artists, uh, you know, who I think for obvious reasons are, are very resistant uh, to seeing education as uh, something which is the kind of... Uh, a, a delivery system for, for professional um, certifications and whatnot. Uh, in architecture school, I say the response uh, has been less positive, frankly, and I have been challenged by a few of my colleagues who seem a little threatened by the concept. Um, and I understand why, because what I'm proposing is, is really to uh, move away from a model in which many architects rely on educational institutions to support themselves, to receive their health insurance, um, and, and to really maybe see teaching as something akin to service. Uh, and certainly, if I look at the local model here in Los Angeles, in the 1970s and even into the 80s, SIRE, uh, in particular, the Southern California Institute of Architecture, wasn't a place to make a living. Uh, it was a place to teach and share ideas, and the majority of the teachers were practitioners. It really was a night school, 
and uh, it, it provided a release valve in a way for the kind of frustrations of professional life. So what's happened, I think, unfortunately, is that, that teaching itself as an architect has become an end game and a kind of professional circuit. And uh, it's also to the diminishment, I think, of a lot of young teachers who have abandoned practice as a viable space for, uh, for experimentation. It seems that it's possible to live an entire career inside of educational ecosystem. And, and as a result, I think that practice and, 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 and pedagogy have been, have been increasingly uh, uh, split apart. So I, I think all of these issues are kind of um, swirling around each, each other, I suppose. And, and then I think there's a larger uh, social political framework, which, you know, obviously the UK and the US are, are currently in the midst of. So it seems uh, like an appropriate time to have these discussions. Why am I paying all of this money? You know? right. Why am I paying X thousand pounds a year when I could uh, t to talk to, let's say, say, talk to me or to you when actually I could meet you somewhere uh, for much less money? I think this is. Money. I see. So just to me, I'm just. Yeah. T I, I know I'm being uh, stupid, but but it is going to happen. I maybe. No, I mean, no, no but I think you're right. I mean, I think the economics are basically you know, currently askew. I, obviously, technology is, 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 is disruptive in, in almost everything it touches. And I, I think that from my perspective, what concerns me is that the majority of my students are being trained essentially to manually draft, it, you, know, uh, you know, through a software package like Revit, um, which will, you know, which, which seems to me to be a task that eventually will be automated. And um, it's strange that as architect, we continue to work through models of labor-based you know, uh, service to clients that essentially are 19th or 20th century, the kind of industrial line notions of how a building is produced, which rely on the kind of uh, intensive group work of, of a drafting farm. And, and for us to assume that we can actually uh, continue that model of, of, of labor when every other industry has been disrupted by uh, automation, robotics, and I think increasingly artificial intelligence, which will do a lot of the work uh, of, of figuring many like basic things out, including structures, um, it, it seems very dangerous to me. So the question is this, I mean, one... We are in a kind of classroom, and I mean, use the word classroom, I suppose. I'm, I think it's really good to be really nice. Okay, could I ask another question then? Mm -hmm. I, so, I just want, so, if you think it should be a mixture, then you actually yes. do need to keep the spaces and the facilities and the academic staff. So, how do, yeah. how do you have both if one of the problems that you're identifying, or at least it's being talked about, is one of cost and that you would pay so much for these facilities? And, if you're saying you do actually also need that too, then in the end, then people are going to have to just pay for that as well. So you can add something in. But yeah, so, yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's a simple answer. Uh, it used to be a very long time ago when, uh, you know, architectural universities and, and associations and um, schools of architecture were not so prevalent that sometimes education happened in the office. So um, I, I will get, again, and this relies on the kind of goodwill and service of, of, of professionals, that next year we could probably borrow space um, in, inside of a few studios. I, I mean, the reality, I think, for, for free school is that we're going to be able to teach with a projector and 15 chairs and, and some wine. And, and that's all that's required. So, you know, I, 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 I think at least for the first year, we could borrow space. And that would be fine. Um, and maybe that's what we do for the first two years. Because I really, you know, from my perspective, I'm, 
the, the problem with having a facility is that it costs money and it requires maintenance and security and needs to be wired and and all the rest of that. So I, I suppose you could do it like we're doing this right now uh, by kind of uh, taking advantage of other people's networks. Um, but I, I guess it would put the onus of, of kind of responsibility on the student to monitor their own progress because I think one of the advantages and disadvantages of the studio environment, at least here in North America, is that everybody can see everybody's work. And so everybody has a sense, I suppose, in the class of how their peers are doing. So, so absent that kind of physical recording of production, um, beautiful and important things that can happen over the course of an education is failure. That students and faculty have the right to get it wrong because at the end of the day, we can produce as much garbage and as many bad ideas as we want inside of the academy because we don't want to put them in the world. And so the world is filled with a lot of garbage and is filled, I think, with a lot of bad ideas. And, and, and what has happened in schools is that schools have lost their ability to be a space in which we can make it, I think, perfectly acceptable for a student to get it wrong, and to get it wrong repeatedly until it's possible to understand um, how to find an original way of doing something, you know, uh, uh, correctly, but also with a, a great degree of, of, of independence. Because finally, I mean, I, I really believe the only thing we can teach is, is thinking, and thinking is something that can be qualified as because it's not subject to standardization. And, 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 and this is the problem, I think, at the end with a lot of, of architectural education, again, in North America, is that so much of it is standardized, and so much, of, so much of it, I think, runs contrary to what architecture should do best, which is, is question reality, and, and I think question how things are done. Um, you know, whether it's, a, it's an economic problem or a structural problem or a political problem or a socioeconomic problem, I mean, most great architecture has emerged in an age uh, in which it challenged norm. So that's something that we don't teach and we don't value. Again, in North America, I think what we value is, is uh, in, in the school is that we make sure that out of a class of 80, you know, 60 get through. And of those 60, that 40 are doing okay on testing and whatnot, and that of those 40, we try to keep the bell curve low so that no more than 10 fail. And that way you keep people enrolled, that way they keep paying for you to be there, that way the university can water its lawn, etc., etc. So that, that's I think, something that's fundamentally wrong with, with again, this is North, a North American problem, that the, the commoditization of, of, of the exchange of ideas has diminished the quality of those ideas to the point in which I think so much of it is basically um, is pablum. You know, it, 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 it's the kind of sharing of, of rote knowledge. And frankly, you can get that online. So, uh, what was the question? <laughs> well, that's the question. I don't think that uh, you say it's a North American problem. I think it's a problem. I, I, it's not confined to North America. I think. Um, I, would imagine no, I say that to be polite. We, we, we find it, those arguments very familiar. You know, uh, and that's what this group is trying to find, a bit of space to think about these things. Uh, but of course it has to be done outside of an academic uh, structure, because the academic structure doesn't allow you to do that. It doesn't allow you to fail. Not even in the first term. You know, are you allowed to fail? Are you allowed to sort of waste some time to, to think about something? So these deadlines just, uh, I, I'm not a student, but uh, as somebody who look, who's looking from the outside, that seems to be a huge amount of pressure that you can't take that time, what you call a pause, to actually uh, think about things. But, uh, but there are some sort of basic questions, I mean there's some really simple ones, like why are all degrees three, three years long? You know, Roland Barthes wrote a nice, nice essay about to explain why they're all three years young, 
he thought it was to preserve the jobs of academics so they could eke out knowledge over three years. Why is a degree in biology three years and a degree in uh, um, golf course design three years? So not to make one more important than the other, but it's sort of a strange time. And, and I'm wondering how, I, I really admire what you're trying to do. I mean, do you, do you think you can, you can fail? Are you going to have a, would you, you're going to fail gloriously or, or allow this failure? Or, or you, you can't, you can't consider it. What, what would be a failure? If you, let's say this new school, what would you, to you be a failure? It's on paid. Pardon? It's on paid. <laughs> well, I, I mean, at this point, I think the only way you can fail is just not to show up. So, um, I, I don't know. That's a good question. That's a very good question. I, you know, it's, uh, but, but I take your point. I mean, I, I think when you start to examine all of the ways in which education is articulated and presented, you know, whether it's a course outline or a curricular structure or, you know, a credit system or a grade, I mean, all of these things are very artificial. And, and I think have very little to do with the subject you bring up, which is that the tertiary education, assuming that people make their way through secondary education, which is exactly all that. It's, it's testing and, and, and uh, routine memorization and, and uh, you know, doing maths and English and all to that competently. You would hope that university would be the place in which that stopped and that a tertiary education would be a space in which uh, there was room to maneuver. Um, but again, if you're on a three-year clock or you're on a five-year clock and you, you, know, you have to get registered licensed by 27 and you have to start paying your mortgage by 30 and, you know, then uh, I suppose um, taking a pause is very hard. Um, but I, I do think that if you delaminate the subject, and I believe very strongly in this, if we delaminate, I think, the subject of, of uh, how it's paid for, actually, um, it does make it possible for students and faculty to um, be more creative with how they use their time. Um, because, you know, my sense, again, with a lot of my students is that I get the question, well, how do I know I'm getting, you know, my value here? How do I know that you're a good teacher? How do I know that you know I'm getting my uh, my fourteen thousand dollars worth? Um, and you know I don't have an answer to that. I mean because I, I suppose the university tells them, well, such and such is a very qualified architect, and you know you should be lucky to be sitting with. But you know but what I is increasing, which I find all very ironic, is that the most successful architects who teach are barely there and get paid the most. <laughs> so, you know, you get a TA basically for whichever celebrity apparently is attached to the school, but, but as you, I'm sure you well know, I mean, those individuals are on the faculty roster because they are, they're recruitment devices for the institution. Is that familiar to all your students? <laughs> Welcome to London. Um, <laughs> and conversely, um, you know, I find that the hardest working teachers are typically the more modest, you know, local practitioners who really love to teach. Uh, and I hear this from students all the time, like, who did you learn the most, most from, Lem Poolhaas or, you know, Joe Blow, or, you know, Jolene Blow, as it were. Um, and, and the answer typically is like, well, no, actually, I saw that guy once, and, and really, I sat with, you know, Don or Mary or